Gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you again today. We should have more time than than last last time. So I'm also on the way to to Lit Cologne. So that was very convenient. So tomorrow is going to be a literature evening for for me and those of you who will be around. So uh, um, so the topic of today is uh, the meaning of life, which of course everybody knows that it's 42. This, you know, those of you who have laughed and have just raised your uh, sort of voice to reading the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And the basic plot there is that people are sick and tired of asking the same question since the beginning of history. And that question is, what is the meaning of life, universe, and everything? So they construct a machine, a computer, who is to finally come up with an objective, scientific, mathematic proof that will once and for all solve this stupid question that's bugging mankind since the time immemorial, and that's the answer to the meaning of life. So they construct this machine, the machine says, I understand the question, and I can do it, but it will take a very long time. It will take a couple of hundred years, I think. So, of course, people are patiently waiting. In the meantime, philosophers are on strike because they fear that once this question is resolved, they will lose their jobs. And after 100 years, the computer wakes up from its mathematical slumber and it says, now I have the answer. So the whole multiverse, this is a science fiction book, the whole multiverse gathers to hear the answer, uh, the most important question, the most burning question. And the computer says, so it's clear, I have tested it in all sort of t-tests, and the answer is 42. So people are as silent as you are, most of them disappointed, and they don't know what to think of this. And the computer says, no, but this is really the case, the answer is 42. Now, in one way, uh, this joke or this funny situation is funny because I think it really describes quite well the, the method that we have chosen to answer uh, the, the, the meaning of life. In one way, it's exactly what we want. It's an objective answer that is independent of the religious, cultural, and all other contexts, everything that your grandmother tells you. It is a sort of a, uh, an ideal Descartes, Descartian wish, because René Descartes also wanted to find something solid on which he could build and to discard the whole history of thinking sort of behind him. So he doubted everything that was known to mankind all the way till now or till then, trying to find out one thing, sort of the, 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 the one firm point in the intellectual universe on which he could build this new belief system, which today we call science. So it's uh, objective, it is not subjective, the answer that the computer gives. It is uh, mathematical, it is very complicated, it is something that we cannot do, we need a computer to do that for us. And, uh, um, and it also uh, is mathematical. Now, most of us, when we close our eyes, and I say the word truth, of course I don't see into your brain, there's never been a sociological research uh, carrying this question, so I really don't know. But when I close my eyes and somebody says the word truth, I sort of imagine a mathematical formula floating somewhere independently in the space, similar formula that guards the movements of the stars, and uh, is, is, is like that. Truth should be like that. Truth should not be subjective, truth should not be uh, uh, context related, truth should not be moody, truth should not be very much alive, truth should be unchangeable, um, uh, very much in, in, the, in the history, uh, so following sort of the, the way Greek thinkers were thinking. Now, the joke is, of course, that the answer itself doesn't make any sense, of course, without the context. <laughs> only to discover that more of the truth, more of the meaning, now that we're talking about the meaning of life, uh, more of the meaning really lies in the context itself, 
rather than in the very answer. Now, let me give you a practical example of what I mean by the very method that economics uses to kind of come up with objective truths that are context irrelevant. So what we do is, this is I think the way economics has been functioning, is that we take all the soft things, all the philosophical, all the moral, all, all the uh, psychological, let's say, elements, and we suppress them into uh, the surroundings. And then this allows us, and these surroundings are uh, assumptions uh, or, or the building stones of the very model. So the model itself, so this allows us to get rid of the soft things, and then we are able to build um, a structure that looks exactly, extremely robust and mathematical. So in order to mathematize life, which is the method of science, pretty much, is exactly, especially in economics, to push the, the, the soft aside into the context of uh, the answer itself, and then being able to produce an exact number. So one has to ask how many numbers that we hear in economics are exactly 42s. These numbers, of course, that we hear in economics make no sense if you discard the context. So let's take a very stupid example. Every day you hear this in the, in the, in the, in the, in the media. An analyst is asked, what's the inflation in the month of March? And he or she will say, well, the inflation in the month of March, March was 0.9. Okay, so uh, this answer is meaningless unless you, of course, know the context. So the immediate question then follows, is that good or is that bad? Is that too little or is that too much? And then, of course, the economist starts giving you his very subjective answers to, to this question. So what we have done in economics, <clears throat> so for example, uh, the way we construct our rigorous models is um, very unrigorous. If one wants to be rigorous, because that's what mathematics is about, I suggest we should be rigorous all the way. So when we make an assumption, so we have life, and we want to build a model, so we simplify the situation by uh, reducing life to something that um, is indisputable. So for example, uh, the, the question whether human beings are rational or not. Uh, this is something that is one of the basic assumptions in economics, and of course we don't know whether human beings are rational or not, so we assume that they are. Which is fine, but what we should do is we should say, well, what's the probability of that assumption being, being appropriate? So let's say that it's 50-50. Fine, so now we are building a model but we know that we are building the model on 50% probability. Then another assumption that human beings are free, for example, to choose, that they are independent of their whatever social surroundings, and that's another 50-50, or 60-40, I really you know, don't care. But this exercise of assuming probabilities to assumptions is, I think, useful exactly because at the end of the day, we discover that we are building a very strong and mathematically elegant and extremely complicated model, but we are moving on an 8% probability space. So we've sort of beaten down life to 8%, and on that 8% we've built uh, a sort of a reversed pyramid on which top is uh, an answer which is like 42. Now, economics has tried to pretend or at least look like a science or social science that is independent, objective, scientific and uh, value free. I would exactly like to reverse this and try to think in an absolute reversal and ask a question, well what if economics is in fact a moral school in disguise? And then if you look at the situation like this, you will discover that economics, in fact, is, I would today say, the most 
um, agreed upon religion. It's the most uh, uh, ecumenical religion. We understand that every culture has different religions or every individual has different uh, languages and tastes and norms and morals, but there is one economics. And to this economics, we subject everything else which is around us. Even as mankind, we have gotten rid of the morality which doesn't produce utility. Oh, you can hear this pretty much even from, I'd say, for example, Christian circles, Christians, Christian political parties <clears throat> have taken in very many countries the topic of family as one of their key, uh, key, key subjects. I don't know where they took this from, by the way, because if you read the New Testament, there is very little positive about the whole idea of family. Um, you know, there was this disciple who wanted to follow Jesus, but his father just passed away. And uh, when he said, I want to be a follower, Jesus said, well, come and follow. And he said, oh, yes, but I just need to bury my father. And Jesus looks at him like one big question mark. He says, what? Oh, he's already dead. Let the dead bury the dead and follow me. Who doesn't hate his mother or father uh, is not worthy of me. Uh, and if you're still not convinced, read what Paul thinks about marriage. You know, it's better for men not to marry, but if you can't hold your horses, then you know you, you should do it rather than screwing around. But uh, that's basically what marriage uh, was in, in many passages. Uh, but nevertheless, the argumentation with which we consider such a thing like family is exactly: if we wouldn't do it, then the social system wouldn't work. If we wouldn't have firm families, the pension system would crumble down, um, and uh, etc., etc., etc. So at the end of the day, even this one example is um, judged according to economic argumentation. We'll take another topic, which is, uh, which is, for example, the value of art. This is something that we are now calculating as economists uh, very often. What's the GDP? Um, added value of supporting culture and art. And my question always is, well, what if we find out that the contribution is negative? This is possible. I mean, I think good art shouldn't be, you know, inducing us to do more work and uh, uh, it should distract us from work, good art, I think. Um, should, well, if we find out that art really contributes to GDP negatively, then should that mean that we should get rid of it? So even in art, you see that art has become a, a subject of, of economic well-being. And the same thing with, is with researches concerning corruption. You know, corruption is harmful to the economy. Okay, what if it wouldn't be? Would then that mean that stealing is legitimate if it helps the economy? So you can see that even in these sort of uh, debates that you read in the newspapers almost on a daily basis or follow in the TV or radio, the argumentation that you hear is uh, basically economic argumentation in disguise. So it's really economy that we are morally following and subjecting other issues that would formerly never be uh, uh, subject to economics to uh, an economic analysis. So. What is uh, economic ethics telling us? There's been this huge debate that we should, uh, we should add ethics into economics that, you know, uh, this and that. But economics already has an ethics of its own, a, a very strong ethics. Now, just because it has ethics doesn't mean that these ethics are, are moral, but it definitely is <clears throat> some sort of ethic. Like the communists had their ethic, like the Nazis had their ethics, like the Romans, like the Greeks, they all had their ethics with which they functioned and with which they considered to be correct, which today we would by no chance consider correct. Well, what is then the economy telling us? Well, if you study economics properly, you will understand that you should maximize your utility, which is, of course, a huge debate in, uh, in, in moral schools. Is there such a thing as utility? Should we do things because they increase utility? Well, in economics, you are convinced that this is, in fact, the case. Economics also advocates uh, the legitimacy of being um, uh, egoist. Because economics, this is one way how we sort of smuggle in the, the, the ethical norms or, 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 or the values is that we say the word is. 
We don't argue that human beings, that is good or bad, we say human beings are egoists, period. But that, of course, is something that I find uh, illegitimate because that is a debate stopper. You can't continue in the debate if you come with this, uh, with this, well, this is what economics is based on. You have to believe that economists, or that human beings function according to utility or maximizing, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, there are <coughs> egoists who function on, on maximizing utility. Economics is also telling you not to care about the impacts of what you do. This is the famous theory of the invisible hand of the market. Whatever you do, moral or immoral, contributes to general well-being <coughs> of the society. This is something that Bernard Mandel came up with um, half a generation before Adam Smith, writing his very famous book, uh, The Feeble of the Beast, or how private vices uh, con contribute to, to, public, to public benefit. So whatever you do, the invisible hand of the market turns it into, uh, into, into general welfare. Um, only to realize that there is no such a thing like an invisible hand in the markets. The only, the only hands that there are are our hands, and those hands can heal, those hands can hurt, those, ha those hands can build, those hands can construct, and those hands can create good things as well as, as bad things. And it is, of course, a huge moral debate whether we are responsible for the actions that our deeds have on third parties. If a, a big, uh, let's say, yogurt producing company starts selling its yogurts in India, is that company responsible for the destroyed lives of local farm producers who will you know, lose job or perhaps even their livelihoods and families? Is a company responsible for what it does unwillingly or unintentionally to their, their competition? So, my thesis number one is that economics really has used mathematics to um, construct a, a very strong body of morals trying to exactly give us meaning of life. Now, the, the real topic of today is, of course, happy life. Now, let's now turn to theology to ask ourselves the question whether a happy life exists in happy life context. In other words, uh, in the ideal settings, such as paradise, were human beings happy? So let's start with Christianity or Judaism, and there, of course, we have the very famous story of the Garden of Eden, which was very nice. Uh, people were still freshly uh, created. There were no psychological complexes. Uh, the situation was ideal. You know, God made the garden, and he even said that it's good. Uh, <clears throat> the problem comes very shortly, where even in this situation of a perfect setting, Adam is not happy, because we know that Adam felt alone. So God creates this human being who was most likely created in order to have a relationship with this God. Uh, and this relationship doesn't uh, satisfy Adam enough. He feels alone. This is not a nice thing to happen when you, for example, have a friend. And with, when you are with that friend, that friend feels alone. Or when you have a wife or a partner, if that partner of yours feels alone, living in the garden with you, something is not okay. So God creates another human being. This is something that many theologians have, uh, I think, neglected to focus on. And they focused on the fact that the first creation was male and that the second creation was female. And of course, there's lots of Jews for uh, interpretation, which is what we have done in the past thousands of years. But um, uh, almost all of them have failed to realize that with creation of Eve, according to this story, another human being was created, never mind the fact that it was a she or he. So suddenly we have uh, uh, a creation that lives in a perfect setting of economic abundance, work is pleasant, uh, there is enough of things to eat, to see, uh, no ecological problems, um, uh, 
uh, direct access to, to, to the meaning of life or to God. Um, and yet, even in this situation, Adam feels uh, unsatisfied, alone. And then another human being is created, so a society, this I think is the beginning of uh, a society, a society is created, a society of one person and another person, only to find out that when Eve is eating from the apple, or from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she is also alone when she's doing that. So there must have been something quite wrong even in this ideal setting which the all-powerful uh, God had, has created. You can see a similar, similar topic in the New Testament if you recall the parable of the prodigal son. So those of you who don't recall, uh, there, is a, there is a very rich father who has two sons and one of them uh, decides that he no longer wants to live with the father in this safe haven and he wants to take the money that is due to him as inheritance and he leaves the father. He leaves a perfect setting only to squander all his money with, um, with, with horse and betting and gambling and when he is eating with the pigs because there is no other work that he can find, he, and this is I think, I don't know how it is in, in, in your German translation, but in English translation there is this very, very puzzling sentence, but we say this quite often in daily conversations also, he came to himself. So, wait a minute, let's pause here a little bit. What is the distance then between self and self <coughs> if it took him so much pain to, to breach it? How can somebody come to himself? What is the nature of the gap? And immediately one has to ask oneself this question, and we do this quite often, am I myself? Am I what I did <coughs> Friday evening? Was that really me? I ask myself almost every Saturday morning. <laughs> and there is this little, of course, time distance of, of some hours, but psychologically I feel detached from the meaning which I saw and that was shown in my actions only a couple of hours ago. This is, I think, and I will end my theological uh, sort of section uh, right now, this to me is the meaning of, of, of God's name, I am who I am. Whereas we human beings are the ones who we are really not. I am not the one who I am is, I think, how human being feels quite frequently. I feel displaced. I don't feel myself. I don't even know what I myself desire. Let's go into this desire. So now I'm moving a little bit into psychology, if you allow me. And there's a very interesting movie called Stalker. I don't know if I talked about it here last time. If I did, please tell me. And Slavoj Žižek, the Slovenian um, the philosopher, uh, has a very interesting reading of this movie. In this movie, uh, or in this book, uh, Picking by the Roadside, there is a zone, and that zone is a very weird zone, but one of the things it does, it gives you what your heart desires. So, there was a very rich man who paid a lot of money and went through a lot of danger in order to get into that zone because his brother was sick. So he made it, uh, all the way to the zone to make his wish, and he wished for his brother to get well. He returned back to his home only to find out that that night his brother has passed away, but he has won, uh, I don't know, 10 million rubles in a lottery. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that apparently the zone kept its promise, but it kept it more brutally than one would expect it gave you what you really desired. Mm -hmm. Not what you desired to desire. <coughs> In other words, this man never liked his brother or never cared for his well-being, perhaps he even hated him. 
and he wanted money, he was interested in money, but he, of course, didn't know this or he would never even admit it to, to himself because he is brought up by this context of having to be nice. Now my question, of course, to you is, if there would be a zone like that, would you enter it? A zone that, on the first hand, looks uh, a dream come true, a zone that gives you what you desire, the only problem is it gives you what you really desire, not what you desire to desire. So, in other words, the lid between, let's say, this primordial id and ego or superego is dismantled and things come out uh, uh, uncensored, so to speak. Question number two, do you know of a person whom you would be happy to send into that zone? Do you know a person who could go there, maybe he or she would wish that there would be a peace on earth and that and children wouldn't have to die of hunger? Um, do you know a person who you could entrust, uh, whose desires are this pure and this, this clean? That exactly seems to be, uh, I think, the problem of, um, of, of, of us human beings. Now, my, my uh, fourth stop so my first was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with a little bit of mathematical mythology when it comes to our idea of searching for the truth. The second one was a theological exposition of trying to find out whether human beings are capable of being happy if everything around them is nurturing happiness to them. Um, and the answer in both questions is, 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 seems to be from, from just reading the Bible. No, we can't be in the state of a paradise for too long because we have a tendency to leave it. So it seems that us human beings are very strange. We try to do everything we can in order to get into a paradise of sorts. Once we are in it, we try to do everything we can to somehow leave it. And this sort of eternal circle is my sort of working conclusion from this expose number two, theological one. Third, third one was um, was an expose from, um, from, let's say, psychology, asking uh, about the desires or, or the meaning of life. The third one, uh, sorry, the fourth step, uh, the fourth stepping stone will be a little bit of political economics, namely uh, a very revised popular critique of capitalism, which is Marxism or neo-Marxism, you know that this is something that has been on the rise. Now, one of the key critics of Marx and, and neo-Marxians and, and many uh, other sort of left-leaning thinkers is that uh, we are oppressed by a system. That the system, in this case capitalism, oppresses us and disconnects us from ourselves. That there is something that this allows us to, uh, to be free. Something that it's banking, other thing that it's money, something that it's private property. This is this is very close to the opinion of, of Marx. But there is something that distracts uh, a normal or pleasant functioning of a society. Now, in this false example, I would like to hit, uh, kill two birds, if I may, with one stone. Now, uh, the first bird that I want to well kill, at least expose that it exists, um, is what I call pre-scientific mythological imagery that we have in our brains without ever critically questioning it. Immediately comes an example. When I say the word oppression, we immediately think, and again, I don't know how this is in your fantasy, but in, I again think, no, no research has been done on this, but tell me, how many of you, maybe we can do this by actually asking, now, when I say the word oppression, do you feel that the oppression is from above? How many of you have it like that? So the majority of you, the, the oppression is from above. And you never, like me, ask yourself a question, how should it be otherwise? So, of course, you know, the ideal, I could be standing, but the system oppresses me, I can't really stand straight, it disallows me from my higher, or disconnects me from my higher self. Thus, this oppression must be uh, dealt away with. But what if the image that we hit our head would be oppression that would be sideways? That's 
uh, it's also a legitimate way of looking at it because I want to walk there, but there is something, maybe like a wind or gravity or magnetism or some sort of pressure that presses me sideways. And I'm trying to walk there, and as hard as I try, I end up at the wine bar, for example. <laughs> um, now, that changes the discourse a little bit. But let's take this clockwork thinking one step further, and what if this oppression is from below? In other words, what if the system disconnects me from my lower desires? Not from my higher desires, but in fact from my lower desires. And if you actually think about it, of course, the system does oppress you from some of your higher desires, I don't know, you want to be with your family, but some social pressure oppresses you so that you have to work harder and blah, 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 so. But most commonly, <coughs> I think, the system disallows you to be your lower self. So I want to murder <clears throat> because he's a real idiot and every time I hear his voice, it just kills me and so I will no longer take this utility, no, sorry, sorry, I no longer will take this disutility I killed a person or whatever. I want, to, I want to be drunk all day, I want to screw around. These are sort of things that are not allowed by the system. Now, if the system, if the image of the oppression, which is completely unnatural to us, that in fact the oppression is from below, then um, uh, the discourse is completely different because in that case, certain oppression system of the system that this allows me to do what I want from below, some sort of censorship. So I know what I want, but I need the law to help me. I don't want to kill, but just to make sure we install the law that if I kill, I will, be, I will go, to, go to jail. This is sort of the link to the Tarkovsky's zone. There is some sort of a lid between my desires, my real desires, my, let's say, intuitive desires, and the um, uh, properly Christian or some otherwise censored um, desires, which are a result of some sort of a self-oppression that I do on my desires. And of course, psychologists, Freudian and, and Jungian could go on talking about this forever, how then it reflects in your dreams and da di da di da da you can't really properly suppress it. But anyway, at least during our social contact, we suppress a lot of the things that we really think. I don't know if you've seen this a little bit, well, it's uh, not the most clever movie, but it does have a very good point with Jim Carrey, liar, liar. Uh, this, I don't know, I don't remember how exactly it happened. I think this small boy praise that his father doesn't lie all the time. I think this is the way it happened, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, some miracle happens and this lawyer cannot lie. So everything he says is in, in an immediate um, uh, truth uh, that he wants to tell to his person. And of course, his career as a lawyer is um, uh, bankrupt the next day because he cannot lie in court. But more importantly, he cannot even properly socially interact with his closest people because why do you have yellow, yellow teeth? Which is a question that a child can ask. You know, you know, uncle, why does uncle have yellow teeth? Why does his breath stink? Uh, why is he such an idiot? You know, um, and, and, and this and that, a child can ask, he will, that child will be scolded, but it will be forgiven. As an adult, of course, you think these thoughts all the time as well, um, but you don't say them, you censor them. If this, is, if this self oppression is removed, a catastrophe would probably happen. The whole society would most likely uh, decompress uh, or decompose itself. <clears throat> Even this, another movie which is a little bit smarter, which is called The Invention of Lying. I don't know whether, whether, whether it has, it has, it's not the most mainstream movie, but it's also quite a nice movie. There is this society in which everybody is brutally honest. Uh, um, it, no, it's a nice movie, I of course recommend it too. Now the question is which glass will I take? The empty one, the one with water, or the one with wine? Um, so this was my, um, this was my 
so that's one stone that I wanted to wanted to one bird that I wanted to talk about is that in fact we think that we're done with mythology, but in fact the mythology is happily surviving in our brains, never mind the fact how much scientific layers we have on it, exactly because the idea of oppression and that image, mythological image, is that this oppression is happening from above. <clears throat> My second point is, what if Marx made a crucial mistake? What if he really criticized human condition and he wrongly attributed that with capitalism? Because the feeling of alienation from my loved ones, or even the alienation from myself, or the alienation of the works that I produce, this is, uh, and the feeling that the system is screwed up, this is nothing new. You will find this in the New Testament. There, uh, the New Testament sort of social, or well, yeah, cultural critiques of the New Testament go even further than it than Marx, you know, that the New Testament writers are very happy to say that the system of the world, they call the system of the world, or the system, is really in the hands of the devil, it is beyond cure, etc., etc., etc. So this idea that the system is full of paradoxes, that the system is, is un, unthought, uncivilized, that the system is really lying in some sort of weird <coughs> darkness, this is not new. This is something that you see in the New Testament, even in, in, in some of the older writings, but most clearly in, in Paul's, Paul's part, uh, Apostle Paul's part of, of the New Testament. So, uh, secondly, this is a human condition. It has nothing to do with capitalism. Now, when Marx is criticizing, uh, he quite frequently actually criticizes urbanization, he criticizes uh, 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 technological advances. He criticizes the new modes of, 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 uh, of, of um, factory work, which is based on specialization to the point that you don't even know what you're doing, which I think is a nice image of the society today. We are a society of oblivion. We don't even know what it is that we are constructing. Each one of us does a little think. And also, please understand that we need professional, uh, professional people to tell us that our work has meaning. These people are called managers. Uh, and if they are not good enough, then they call, then they, uh, call uh, motivational speakers. This is not so strong in Europe, but in the United States of America, you will always have somebody who will tell you that your that you're saving the world by producing pins or, 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 or something. This is very <laughs> crucial. So, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, or Marx is criticizing urbanization. And again, uh, I come from a capitalist country, uh, sorry, formerly communist um, country. And there, we of course had the same factories, even more production oriented than we have today. Growth, or the idea of non-growth, today is very often associated with the left. People who argue that growth isn't really necessary are very often put into the left sort of political hemisphere for reasons unknown, because it was exactly communism that wanted to grow and outgrow capitalism. In communism, everything was calculated, the, the, the five-year plans, in which every single man and woman had to sort of work at least 5% harder than last year was much more brutal uh, than today. And industrialization was also something that was completely stronger um, or was a much stronger belief in the communist countries rather than in the, in the countries of the West, as well as the neglect to the environment. Neglect to the environment was not a right-wing idea. Again, this was something that was very strongly flourishing during the communist times. On the contrary, if you read the proper right classical literature, such as Thomas Malthus or Thorsten Veblen, there you will sort of immediately get the idea that it is leisure which is the signifying quality of the rich. So, of course, you could also argue completely in the opposite term, it is the leftish 
who argue for growth, if you take two steps back, while the properly uh, classical right-wing thinking in economics is exactly about this leisure. Or um, John Stuart Mill is talking very extensively about um, stationary state. This was the topic of modern, oh, sorry, of classical economics. The question was not so much in the process, but how will a stationary state look like? Once the economy starts growing, oh, sorry, stops growing, how will that system look like? Will it be a nice system or will it be a bad system? So Malthus, for example, believed that it will be quite a sad system in which you will have few rich people and very many poor people and there is no point in increasing the, the, the minimum sort of um, substantive wage because if you do that, these proletariats will multiply themselves and there will be more of them and thus the wages will again decrease. So that's when economics became a dismal this was science, which was also then important in, uh, in Marx's thinking. <clears throat> so um, this debate on the ideal, sorry, on the stationary state has disappeared, as you all know, from today's economics. And the economics today focuses on one maximum two-year plan, and it can tell you the GDP or, or some other uh, prophecy that we have taken from God knows uh, where. It's also very funny now that I'm making fun of my own profession. Please understand that if I'd be a sociologist, I would make fun of sociology. If I'd be a philosopher, I'd make fun of philosophy. And there's so many you know, beautiful points that you could make fun of. Um, if I'd be, I don't know what, no. but I'm an economist, so I'm making fun of, of economics. I am doing exactly the reverse of what has been the tradition in economics, and that is taking economics seriously and laughing <coughs> at any other field of knowledge. I'm trying to laugh at economics and take any other field of knowledge quite seriously, and even the past findings that, again, we have been used to laugh at. So I'm sort of reversing that. And also, just to make this point clear, when you have a literature critique, you don't expect him or her to hate literature. And this is also my case as well. I'm the critique of economics, not because I hate it, but exactly because I love it, I care for it. If you have a movie critique, that person will not hate movies, that person enjoys movies and, and cares for them and wants to sort of maybe push it a little bit forward. So um, that was my fourth stop political economy, and there I was trying to kill two stones. One, to demonstrate on a practical example, mythological imagery that we have that really forms our opinion more than any empirical research in the positioning of, of the images. Um, that was my first one. And second, my second point was that Marx was really, in my opinion, criticizing human condition, but he misallocated it and started criticizing capitalism. We shouldn't make the same mistake today. We really should be very rigorous about what is it that bugs us uh, and then, because of course, the real application of Marxism didn't dismantle any of the things that it wanted to and made the matters even worse. My fifth and final point will, uh, will uh, be philosophy and then I would perhaps end so that we can have we can have 45 minutes, 10 more minutes of me talking, and then we could do uh, uh, open up the floor, of course, to your critical review of what you have heard. Um, this is, I think, my most controversial point. So if you don't like it, uh, just skip it. It's a chicken and bone principle. Eat the meat, leave the bones. Uh, <coughs> We have this idea, again, in, in moral philosophy especially, that the positioning of good and evil is like this. Good, evil. This, of course, you can stop here, and even that stop will last you for a couple of hours of, of interesting thinking. How is that? Is there a zero dotted line in the middle of good and evil, where evil is like good but with the negative? sign is the distance from the normal and then you come to this huge great question well, is there a neutral ground is there a zero moral ground uh, of course this is a huge 
almost impossible thing to answer. But anyway, the imagery that we don't know where we bought it, how we bought it, we've never tested it, never asked ourselves the question, is again most commonly good, evil, with a dotted line in the middle. Mathematically speaking, the absolute value of good and evil is equal. The yeah, absolute value rids the minus sign away. So this is sort of dualism with which Augustine, uh, uh, with which Saint Augustine tried to deal away the idea that good and evil are sort of balanced powers only with a negative, negative sign. This is something that was called Manichaean heresy, that good and evil, good and evil can be counted and could be measured. But you can still, I would subject that this would still be the most popular belief today, judging from the jokes that we have about St. Peter being at the gate of heaven, always looking at the books and saying, okay, well, you carried the groceries, so that's 10 points, but you really watch pornography, and I don't know what that's, that's a minus point. So wait a minute, let me just, you know, put that into my 42, and so you're good to go. Congratulations. But your, your friend here, that's just, you know, almost, but not good enough. You must go, uh, you must go to hell. So, uh, good life. Now, um, how should I put this? I'm again thinking, and I again repeat that this is a thought that I uh, am entertaining and I don't, this is still work in progress, if I may. What if the situation between good and evil would in fact be like this? Because with this, you have a huge problem, which in the history of moral philosophy I would call the problem of gravity of evil. If evil is evil and good is good, why would people do evil things? What's the gravity of evil? If evil is lesser than good, then there is, I should be attracted to good things rather than to bad things. And of course, there is 2,000 answers to this something that is the emotions that guard, guide us away. And, but I will not go into, into that. Thomas Aquinas says that um, it is stupidity that, uh, that uh, makes us do evil thing, things. That in long term, rationality, again, you could even be brutal. If you want to be brutal, you could say that this is utilitarianism in disguise. But because what you hear is, well, you know, you should really be clever. Long-term utility is higher than your short-term utility. So you're not being evil, you're being stupid. Because you're destroying your life um, uh, um, because of some, sorry, you, 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 you destroy your life in long-term because of short-term utilities. Which is, of course, utility, long-term utilitarianism. This is the famous sentence I am afraid that my personal life will destroy me. Which, if you think and pause about this, is a very interesting statement. It really says, I'm afraid that I will destroy myself with my person. But, what if the, uh, the, I, the, the evil situation is in the idea of better? And let me again come to, to, to this with the, with the use of motivational speakers like I have talked about a second, a minute ago. You will often hear during the New Year's speeches something like this from your managers or your, from, from your motivational speakers. So they will say, the year 2013 was really good, you were good, everything was good, but you know what's the biggest <coughs> enemy of, of, of best? Good. So don't you get stuck on good. You have to try very, very hard to be better and better and better. Now, if it's true, and it probably is true, that the uh, idea of good is the biggest enemy of the best, then the reverse must be also true, that the biggest enemy of good is not evil, perhaps, as we have been taught and, 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 and thinking for a long time, but perhaps the biggest idea of evil is the idea of better. Now this, in some way, makes sense 
In other ways, it doesn't make sense. Well, what are you saying? Are you saying that the idea of progress is bad? No, I'm saying that it's double-faced. So let's, sorry, I, I promise that I will no longer do theology. One last, one last stupid example from the Garden of Eden. God creates everything and he says, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, until Adam and Eve come up with the idea of making it better. And in fact, when they taste from the fruit, God says, now they know something that they didn't know. In other words, their knowledge improved. They are <laughs> like us. So, of course, the most subversive way how to read this passage is that God tried to make a superior, or gods, or whatever he talks in plural, he tried to create a superior being that was ignorant of certain facts. So it is technically possible that something is better which doesn't, that is smaller in knowledge than, 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 so obviously God knew the difference of good and evil. In the Hebrew, the word knows also means sexually. So Adam knew his wife, means that he, they, they, they did this thing. And, um, and so the same word is used for the knowledge, the tree of knowledge. So it was an intimate knowledge. It wasn't a theole theoretical knowledge. It was an intimate knowledge. They did it. Like we say, you know, this is also funny. Um, when, when, when I say I did it, or they did it together, we all know what the it was. So they did it. What did they do? They tried to improve reality. So in other words, what Adam and Eve could have been thinking in the Garden of Eden was, is this it? Is this all there is to life? Is this all there is to reality? This can't be. This must be somehow improved. And they really did. Now, so that I don't get stuck in, 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 in Christian or Hebrew theology, the same thing appears in Greek mythology when Prometheus is giving technai to human being, which very often is shown as fire in our art. But the word used there was, was technai, technology, knowledge, which the fire, of course, was a symbol of. And this is what angered gods. Human beings were not supposed to know certain things. Well, I don't know why, but this is, this is the, the, the imagery that we as mankind have for some reason in many myths that are completely unrelated. The same thing is um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, Enkidu sort of describes how a brute animal-like creature becomes a human being and the process is, um, oh, how should I do this very, very, very quickly, he basically moves into the city and it is written on, on one of the tablets, he gained reason and understanding, but the animals ran away from him. So how to understand this? He, 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 he started being wise, he started being rationality, he started getting rationality. I think for, for you Germans and for me Czechs, uh, there is this beautiful sentence that I think we both will enjoy. Uh, it's written, he tasted beer and thus he became a human being. Yeah. So, um, although we have this feeling that if we drink too much beer, we become animals, uh, the opposite is true. So this is basically for those beer lovers, and I can see some happy faces, <laughs> not so happy faces from some others, but this is, this is the way. It, you know, I was thinking that it would be a perfect joke, uh, sort of a nice little movie clip where animals would get drunk, and if animals would get drunk, they would become very reasonable, like human beings. <laughs> you know, and then talk about stories. Remember how we got drunk last Friday? Yeah, we wore ties, and we got put some clothes on, even though the room was really hot. We put clothes on, and we had a meeting. Remember how we had that meeting? And you were so serious, yeah? And we were trying to keep time. It would, I mean, it would be a nice, nice little um, reversal. I also use alcohol when it comes to the debate when, uh, about uh, whether human beings are reasonable or not. Because uh, to my knowledge, you know, alcohol is one way how to get rid of reason. And to my knowledge, you always get drunk sober. You know? So you, you reasonably get rid of reason. 
This is called uh, this is called drinking. <laughs> but never mind. Let me bring this to the close. So uh, my point is, and now again, I will again close it with with economics. What is the meaning of economics? Well, what is tempt What is now tormenting us? really today is not that we are poor and that the situation is not good what's tormenting us is that the situation isn't better that means we are deprived of gdp growth to put it in very blunt terms this is what torments us we do not so much care about just so for example my point is and i again i have nothing against growth but to me that's a priority number i don't know six seven why don't we talk about justice in society as a cure to the illnesses that we are suffering from? Or stability of the system, that to me is much more important. You know, I basically want a car that doesn't explode and speed is... Yeah, it's maybe like when you buy a car. The, the maximum speed, is it an important thing for you? Yeah. Is it a thing number one? Well, not for most people. For most people, it would probably be safety or comfort or I don't know, whatever. But not speed. So why, how, why did this... <clears throat> and so that's why we feel that the situation is, um, is, is evil. So we are... Um, we are um, <laughs> no longer able to see the meaning in, uh, in, in anything else, almost, than uh, multiplying the meaningless upon which we all agree. So we don't know where we are, we don't know which direction we are going, we are guided not by any great vision, we are guided, if you haven't realized, by this thing that I called unorchestrated orchestrator. <coughs> to markets, the invisible hand of the market, you mustn't orchestrate it. Lesser fair, lesser passé, don't you meddle, and least of all, don't you meddle ethically. So it's unorchestrated, you can't orchestrate it. It will, in turn, orchestrate you. It will tell you the meaning of life, it will tell you the value of life. This was beautifully shown in, the, in, the, in this movie, Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street, where, in fact, the values were created by, let's say, rhetorics or make-believe, even you can call this religion because it deals with faith. Uh, only we have learned or got into the habit of calling it um, economics or stock markets. It's a business of, of, of trade, of, of, of beliefs. So, um, mm, yeah, so to sum it up, economics has become uh, a disappointing uh, generator of meaning of life. We're not happy with it, but the only thing we can do is to have more of it. Um, uh, that's my first concluding point. My second concluding point is that we, you can live in a, and I'm not saying by far, although there are many philosophers who say that the existing world is the best possible, but I'm not saying this. But even if you live in the best possible world, we will still destroy it by trying to improve it. So thank you very much for your attention, and now I'm really looking forward to what you say to this. Thank you.